Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first Reflow webinar, a series of talks focusing on making cities more circular and regenerative. My name is Erwan Moisan. I'm director of Ecovala, a Finland-based consultancy focusing on circular innovation and capacity building, and I will be your host for this session. Um, today, we'll deep dive into urban metabolism, an approach that has the potential to accelerate the transition to more circular practices in urban context. We'll hear from practitioners and experts about the potential of such tools and discuss together how to scale up this approach to make EU cities more sustainable. First, um, Liz Corbin from Metabolic Institute will set the frame and introduce us to their approach on urban metabolism. Anne Louise Lott will give us insights on how this approach has been useful when developing circular strategies in the city of Vail, Denmark. And last but not least, Simon Clement, a senior coordinator, sustainable economy and procurement at ECLE Europe, will give us a broader picture on how such tools and approaches are framed within the European context. In terms of practicalities, feel free to use the Q&A feature during the presentations to ask direct questions to the speakers. They will reply after their respective sessions. And we will also have a dedicated uh, few minutes at the end of the presentations to answer some final questions. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is an event organized by the Reflow project. So first I'll introduce you to the context and objective of the project. So uh, just a little bit of introduction. So over the past 50 years, our human society has grown exponentially and so of our impacts on the planet. I mean, since 1950, for instance, our human population has doubled in size, annual CO2 emissions have increased by 150%, and we've seen an outstanding decline of 60% in biodiversity. So the impacts of this growth on environmental systems is now being felt at the Earth system scale. But if you look at the planetary boundaries framework, which defines nine critical environmental boundaries uh, in which we try to uh, have a humanity safe and operating space. Well, we see that scientists have estimated that three boundaries are actually transgressed, climate change, biodiversity and biogeochemical ge flows. And the impact of this transgression is not just being felt at Hearst systems level, but it's also at human scale. Uh, resulting in a broad range of interconnected sustainability challenges. So if the exponential growth curves are allowed to continue, uh, it will cause many of our life support systems to crash. So our mission actually is to bend those curves and find solutions we need to counteract um, the exponential challenges uh, we have created. So when implementing the solutions we need, actually cities are a primary place to focus. If they only occupy 3% of global land surface, they actually consume 75% of global resources and they produce 60 to 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, at the same time, these trends are projected to increase and it's estimated that 60%, 66% of the global population will actually be living in cities uh, by 2050. So this makes cities not only a critical leverage point for trans transitioning our global system to a more sustainable state, uh, but it's also a perfect microcosm actually for the challenges we are currently facing across the economy. So for this reason, we see cities as perfect sites for prototyping circular solutions. And how do we actually envision future cities? We think that they must be regenerative and waste-free by design and by actually implementing a circular economy approach, we can uh, create lots of opportunities for resource savings, job creation, capacity building, civic engagement, healthy and inclusive environment, and resilience to external shocks. Uh, so this is basically where Reflow project is currently framed. So Reflow is a EU H 2020 project that started in 2019, running for three years. And it aims to understand and transform urban metabolism through analyzing material flows and co-creating and testing sustainable strategies at different levels, business, governance, and citizen uh, levels, for instance. Um, the approach is basically uh, relying on an international research network, uh, different stakeholders uh, focusing 
in different, uh, at different levels. And uh, the particularity of Reflow is that it's taking Fab Labs and, and maker spaces as a sort of decentralized node to actually uh, prototype those circular solutions. Concretely, we are focusing on six pilot cities, which are uh, all of them tackling a specific challenge. Berlin is working around wastewater heat. Amsterdam is working around textile recycling. Milan is looking at food waste in municipal markets. Vele, that will be presented later on, is focusing on circular plastics. Cluj-Napoca is uh, trying to work on uh, energy efficiency in public buildings. And Paris is working around wood waste in temporary and uh, events sectors. So um, what are we expecting in terms of outcomes from the project? Well, basically a set of handbooks, toolkits, some sort of how to, uh, you know, to support cities to accelerate to circular economy, practical documentation on how this transition journey happens in different cities, in our six pilot cities. But it's also about developing business strategies, governance models that actually you know, reinforce this, this transition. Uh, we're also developing a set of platforms, digital platforms to help us monitor data, optimize circular practices through, through data monitoring and data visualization. So it's really something central also to the project. And obviously we also uh, aim to uh, scale up these approaches and convince cities that this is a straightforward way to go. So we developed capacity building strategies webinars, podcasts, et cetera, to, uh, to help uh, disseminate that knowledge. But without further ado, um, I would like to introduce you Liz, that will be the first speaker of this morning. Um, Liz is the director, uh, the research director of uh, Metabolic, uh, leading the activities of the Metabolic Institute Think Tank. Um, she has uh, research expertise in material design, engineering, systems analysis, redistributed manufacturing, and digital innovation. Uh, and Liz is currently investigating how globally connected, locally situated digital fabrication networks can lead to a more environmentally sustainable and socially equitable manufacturing economy. Liz, I will uh, let you share your presentation. The floor is great. Yours. Thanks, Erwin. Hi, everybody. It's super great to be here. Um, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of the technical side <laughs> that we're doing in Reflow, but I promise not to make it too dry um, and give you a little bit of the kind of nitty gritty detail of what we've been doing with Viola in particular. So as Erwin said, we need to start radically transforming the way we govern and how we distribute value in our cities, right? We're consuming about 1.6 planets worth of resources on an annual basis just to fuel our global economy. And the UN projects that that's actually going to double by 2060. And as we know now, to avoid some of the most catastrophic impacts associated to climate change, we have a decade left to half CO2 emissions. But recent figures show that we've actually increased from 53 billion to 55 billion tons of CO2 emissions each year since 2015. So it's now become an imperative that our cities where the bulk of our consumption impacts are coming from on a global um, basis, it's really imperative that we transition our cities to becoming much more regenerative and waste-free within this decade. This decade is our transition 20s, this, the time to act is truly now. Uh, and whilst many cities, in particular those here in the EU, have done an amazing job at really setting ambitious goals, and we have the Green Deal at the European level trying to help cities facilitate progress towards a more circular and sustainable state, what we're finding is that progress is, is actually really stalling. And that's often because we've got a series of systemic barriers at play here. Um, there's very rarely one challenge owner in cities who can be accountable for taking on the task. There's a persistent lack of monitoring frameworks in place in the infrastructure that we really need to manage and monitor progress that we're making. Um, and also, of course, cities are extremely complex systems. So it's really difficult to be able to pinpoint and understand where the highest impact uh, points are, where those leverage points are for maximum progress, and how to design these systems in a way that avoid unintended consequences. 
So what we've been doing in Reflow is metabolic and with the rest of our partners is really asking how can we support our cities to really take on these ambitious goals in, and translate those into concrete actions and measurable results. One of the things that Metabolic is doing with uh, the cities in close collaboration is applying this urban metabolism approach, which uh, has become seen as a powerful tool for urban transformation. With the urban metabolism approach, what we're really doing is we are treating cities like living organisms. And through this approach, we're able to visualize what resources come into the city, how that's consumed by various uh, stakeholders, whether that's industry or citizens or the city itself. And also, of course, how those resources are generated and managed as waste at the end of their life. And this provides us a really holistic view of the city. It helps us understand how natural systems, economic sectors, and also human activities kind of interact and are interdependent upon one another, where the biggest impacts are um, and where there's key inefficiencies or key opportunities that we could take on. Within the Reflow project, we're using this approach to map how each Reflow city is currently functioning as a system. Um, really looking at what local actors are having the biggest influence upon the system and where the direct and indirect impacts associated within this system are being felt the most, whether that's within the city or outside of the city boundaries. And it's really important to say that within Reflow, um, urban metabolism and material flow analysis and so on, all of these technical methodologies really aren't being positioned as such. They're not positioned as technical methods that are developed and delivered by a kind of external expert alone. Um, instead, we're positioning them as sort of an active collective intelligence building. So for each city, the analysis is done in extremely close and um, dynamic collaboration with local driving groups. And this helps us ensure a really smooth integration with the city's existing systems change approach and plan. And what we're using the results of this urban metabolism um, scanning is we are periodically translating these results to the goals and the action roadmaps and the monitoring systems that these city driving groups are actually developing and applying through the reflow project. A practical use case, because it's always a little bit boring to talk about technical stuff at the high level. Um, so we thought today we would share with you how we are applying this within Vila, which is one of the reflow pilot cities, as Erwin said. So within Vila, that, uh, this pilot team has set out to really gain insights into urban plastic consumption and really aiming to increase the circularity of the city's plastic value chains with a particular focus on public housing, food retail, and healthcare. And Anne-Louise will do this far more justice than I, so I'll just tell you the urban metabolism element of this. Um, so as part of that, and to really support the pilot team, what we did is we worked with the Violet pilot team, including the municipality, um, SMEs, and local citizen groups, to map overall the volume and composition of plastic coming into the city, really indexing how that's being consumed by local industry stakeholders, by households, and by the city itself. And then importantly, how that stock is being collected and managed at the end of its life. Really importantly, what we did alongside this, which is called a mass balance, is we looked at the environmental and social impacts associated to this urban plastic consumption. And that's really important because overall volume does not um, show impacts. And it really shouldn't necessarily show where priority interventions should, should take place. Um, moreover, a lot of the impacts associated to the consumption patterns of especially European cities are actually not directly felt within the city itself. So it's super important to do whole life cycle impact analyses to really understand where the indirect impacts um, upstream or downstream are occurring 
that are associated to our European urban consumption patterns so that we can acutely address those as well, kind of like surgeons in the design of this new circular economy. The last thing that I would mention here is that in parallel to metabolic running this kind of city level cross sectoral analysis, the local pilot team was also doing site specific um, assessments of a couple of sites around Vila. And because we matched these and integrated these together, what we were able to do is to provide the pilot team um, more of a kind of holistic systems level insight on the consumption and waste patterns of plastic within the city. And that ran how that ran across household, specific sectors, um, and then also cross sectorally. And that helped the pilot team really understand how their site specific interventions were situated in a broader context, and also gave them insights on how they could prioritize uh, certain interventions and actions within their roadmap. Some key conclusions that are coming out so far from the work is that there definitely needs to be a maybe a bigger focus um, taken to the indirect impacts associated to urban plastic consumption within Vila. Because indeed, the majority of plastics that are consumed within the city are actually being manufactured outside of the city itself. So the social and environmental and health impacts associated to Vila's plastic consumption almost exclusively happen and occur outside of the city's boundaries. So the, the um, upstream CO2 emissions associated to Vila's plastic consumption equates to 32,000 tons of CO2 each year. And that is being felt outside of the city's boundaries. Um, but this is actually equivalent to basically the annual emissions of 5,000 Danish citizens. So that's one thing for us to really look at. How do we incorporate um, kind of scope three emissions indirect impacts into some of this innovation work? Moreover, even though polypropylene is probably the largest um, form of plastic consumed within Vila, the one having the greatest upstream impacts is actually PVC. It, PVC is consumed in quite a small proportion overall, predominantly by two sectors, healthcare and construction within the city. But this small, tiny fraction of plastic is having a disproportionate impact. It's actually equating to two thirds of the air pollutants emitted of all plastics consumed within the city in regards to upstream production. So an acute addressment of PVC uh, can be a critical positive impact point that the city can have. Lastly, in terms of plastic consumption drivers within the city, it's predominantly local industry and households. So within local industry in, in Vila, the ones who are bringing in um, intermediary plastic goods or final plastic goods for retail purposes, they're actually consuming 47% of plastics that come through the city itself. Um, and the lion's share of that percentage is uh, driven by two industries specifically, the local plastics industry and the local food industry, which conveniently, both of these industries are made up by a small number of very large players. So two um, uh, companies within the local plastic industry and actually five major retailers in, in the food retail sector. And this positions Vila in a really good place where to actually cut down impacts really progressively and really radically, they could engage with quite a small number of key influential players. In terms of households, they are the second largest consumer of plastic in the city, which probably isn't so much of a surprise. Um, but one key point here is that they are one of the largest consumers of packaging. And a key issue there is that there is a very, very high contamination rate, particularly with food packaging. So a lot of awareness raising activities on reducing your packaging consumption as a consumer and how to avoid contamination at the collection point would really help, again, a bit like a surgeon, address the uh, acute impacts coming from, from the city itself. Um, in terms of waste, because of course within our cities, that's a really big area of focus. Um, in Vila, about 8,600 tons of plastic waste are, are collected each year in the city. And at the moment, Vila is not rare in this. It's actually quite similar to many cities, but a, a small percentage of that is being reused and recycled. And, and the majority of that um, close to about 63% is getting incinerated. 
So there's a big effort within the city now, which I really applaud and which we're really happy to continue helping with to really understand how we can recapture and reuse those materials more effectively locally and start to bring down that incineration rate. Um, a key player here, of course, as you can maybe see, is definitely food packaging. Food packaging is a huge percentage of plastic waste uh, within the residual waste stream of the city. So again, that small number of stakeholders in the food retail sector are a key partner to really focus on uh, collaborating with going forward to first work with them to just totally eliminate unnecessary food packaging. And then it, first of all, so just to really bring down that consumption in the first place. And then secondly, to acutely eliminate really problematic plastics. So the black meat trays, the EPS trays, the multi-layer packaging, um, these types of plastic packaging just aren't uh, aligned or suitable to um, the plastic, plastic recycling technologies that we currently have in the region. So really working to just full out eliminate those would be a huge step change in the, in the right direction. Um, what we also did is, of course, I mentioned that the pilot team is working with a couple of specific sites locally. So in addition to creating the city level and the cross-sectoral analysis of plastic consumption, we also worked with the pilot to shed a little bit more detail on the specific sites that they're working on. We did this for a couple of sites, um, and this is an example of one of the public housing blocks that they are currently working with as a as a team. So we did an analysis of the waste that they create on a, on a weekly basis. And some of the key insights here so far is that indeed better separation techniques are really needed, especially for that 30% you see of the missed sort of residual plastic. So really to be able to um, increase the separation techniques of especially that quite large percentage through public awareness raising and education will be key and super impactful. And then um, the, the last point is to really avoid, again, these problematic um, packaging materials like black trays and EPS trays and, and meat packaging. So if we can educate consumers on how problematic the food packaging situation is in Vila and those specific plastic fractions that are just entirely not recyclable at all, then uh, we wonder if we actually can apply a little bit more pressure on the food retailers, some positive pressure, to actually really start eliminating and reducing their own consumption of this, of this material stream. So in that way, we can apply some friendly pressure onto industry through increasing consumer awareness. And these insights, as well as the scans that we've done on the other sites, are um, supporting Anne Louise and her pilot team in kind of really um, educating the stakeholders that they're working with within each uh, site, contributing to their public awareness campaigns, and really helping to yeah, add and augment their current activities. So, it's important to say that the Viola team is already doing an incredible job. They're doing a huge amount of work in this space and they're really committed to expediting um, the creation of a circular value, a uh, plastic value chain for the city. And what we kind of see our role in with the application of this methodology is providing even more of a holistic systemic view of the current system. And again, a little bit like surgeons, really looking at those high impact leverage points that could be um, maybe further addressed or added to the current action plans of the city and their strategy to really expedite change. And of course, it will come from no surprise, but the main points that we have recommended so far is to really try to expand the current scope to include upstream impacts and really addressing the impacts that are being felt elsewhere in the world given Viola's plastic consumption to work specifically with the healthcare and construction sectors to reduce PVC use um, and waste, and then work really closely with the food industry to tackle the, the, the food packaging challenge that the city has. So I will now pass you over to Anne Louise, who will give you much more detail on the great work that Viola is currently doing. Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you for your presentation. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much, as much as I also enjoy our 
very close um, collaboration. So um, let me see, I will share now my screen with you guys. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so um, my name is Anne-Louise and um, I work for the municipality in, uh, in Vejle. Um, I'm situated in a place called uh, Spinnerihallerne, which is uh, difficult for most people besides Danish people to pronounce. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a part of the city where um, we work on, uh, on innovation and we have close collaboration with, uh, with Fab Lab as well. So among makers and, and entrepreneurs uh, every day. And then the, the project of Reflow is, is situated between this, you could say, line of work within the municipality and of course also in our technical uh, department where also our um, uh, waste uh, waste management is uh, is situated just to let you know a little bit about the um, uh, the setup for us in in Vaile. so I want to just share with you a little bit more detail on on the case uh, of Vaile and how we work for the next like 10 minutes and uh, of course open for for questions from all of you guys afterwards so, but firstly, I would say maybe just share with you just a few points on Vaile because probably a lot of you guys uh, don't know the city. So it's a, it's a small city in, in Denmark, um, in the southern part of, uh, of Jutland with uh, 60,000 inhabitants and which makes it, uh, I think, the ninth uh, biggest city uh, in Denmark. And uh, of course, the... the the, the municipality of Vail has for many years now worked uh, on different activities in regards to sustainability and, and climate. For example, we have uh, been within the resilient uh, 100 cities. So this has been a huge part of our work uh, during the last uh, 10 years. Then we have just um, formulated our local climate action plan as part of the, you could say, C40 or DK 2020 actions. So you can say in, in that regard, we have a long uh, term work on both climate change and sustainability. Also, uh, co-creation has been in the heart of the, the way that the municipality drives change uh, with both citizens and, and different kind of stakeholders and actors. But only you could say before Reflow, we have had smaller projects and initiatives on, uh, on circular economy. So this is the first real huge step for us uh, to go into a deep dive of, uh, of circularity. <clears throat> yes, so um, as you know by now, uh, what we are really interested in is, uh, is circular plastic and we aim both to, to reduce the plastic in Vaile and also to recycle more of, uh, of the plastic. And how do we do that? Well, uh, Liz made a good presentation on our MFA and uh, also just mentioned our more site-specific plastic analysis and stakeholder analysis. And those two things together uh, informed, you could say, our whole like take on, uh, on, on our actions. Um, and uh, another uh, part of our how we are going about this is to do ideation and prototyping with our local stakeholders and kind of you say not only with our local stakeholders the the drives comes from them but then we we connect it together with the uh, with the the experts uh, within reflow for example Liz and Erwin and our other great colleagues then also we, we work on uh, awareness raising, as Liz mentioned just shortly, uh, creating, you could say, maybe a local movement uh, towards a more circular future, which is both, you could say, within citizens' engagement, but also uh, more broadly on, on, uh, on companies and, and the entrepreneurial level. And then also the last thing I want to mention in our how is that uh, we use a very local testing ground to incorporate these, uh, these, uh, these strategies and I'll get a bit more into that as well. And then importantly, they are not here today, but they, we are driving this change also with our uh, primarily partner, which is Danish uh, Design Center, also situated in Denmark. 
Yes. So uh, you could say that we uh, in Vaila we work on two different levels of intervention. We uh, we see this challenge uh, to circularity as very uh, complex. So we try to to attack it. You could say through the city's different uh, across the, the city's different actors. Um, and we, we work in that way, or both on a systemic level, where we go into, for example, procurement uh, policy within the municipality. And I can see I wrote actually sustainable procurement. And this is a new thing for us because we are used to kind of thinking in sustainability. But actually what I mean is circular procurement. Uh, and this is a really important point for us in the municipality to say, how can we list some demands to our suppliers uh, in a way where we um, uh, where we secure more circularity. Um, also, we work here on uh, different value chains across the cities and across different actors. And then they, we have a very concrete, more involving uh, level where we collaborate with, uh, with companies, public institutions, and also with the citizens. And I'll get into exactly how we do that. First of all, just showing you uh, uh, a little uh, map here on the different test sites that we are working with. Uh, the, all the, the sites shown here is, uh, is part of our plastic analysis. And then we, we decided to, uh, to work more in depth with uh, the, the white, uh, the one colored in white, like the supermarket, our elderly care center and uh, the apartment building. Yes, so um, our research and analysis was exactly this combination between the MFA and our plastic analysis, where we started, you could say, the understanding of the whole uh, value chain uh, for the different test sites. And just to, to show also what uh, these analysis helped us see is that uh, it, it made us identify where the, the really great potentials are, as Liz also uh, mentioned. So all in all, you could say um, across from all the test site, what is really um, uh, obvious is that uh, there's a great potential for better sorting and in that way, increasing the, the recycling of, uh, of plastic. Also, when looking into the, the more public uh, institutions, we, we saw a demand for a more sustainable and circular procurement policy. Uh, and that uh, is really great because uh, when we have uh, when we did the analysis and the climate action plan was uh, was um, um, uh, approved sorry I couldn't find the word was approved by our city council um, they actually put this in as a very concrete point that uh, in in the climate action plan as well so in that way you could say that the initiatives that we are doing in reflow are really closely interconnected with all the different other initiatives that are uh, both on a political level within Vaile, uh, but also on a concrete and practical level um I won't go much into the stakeholder mapping, but uh, we can uh, talk about that maybe later if we have time. <clears throat> so just to show you uh, the scenarios that we are uh, working on now in um, in Vaile, uh, the three first ones to be the you could say the most important ones for 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 this presentation, because it goes specifically on the different uh, test sites and how we. Uh, we work um, we work there so the first scenario is um, decreasing plastic streams in healthcare uh, Liz was uh, talking a bit about this on the on the PVC I will get more into it in just a minute our scenario this is just the first overview um, scenario number two is uh, how can we create more circular loops and uh, and do some more collaboration in uh, in the value chain within retail and our third scenario goes exactly to how can we create better sorting system and also um, do this uh, huge amount of awareness raising when it comes to the citizens uh, level with the point of departure of this one specific area called Den Gamle Gård. So the fourth and fifth scenario uh, goes, uh, you could say, across from all the test sites and actually also across in the city. The first one is, um, the, the fourth one is um, 
is uh, around uh, communication and capacity building. And, uh, and the, the fifth one is, uh, is tech. And I will go deep into that uh, uh, here now, only mentioning that, uh, that this is also part of, uh, of our work. So going a little bit uh, deeper into uh, our uh, three test site scenarios. This is some pictures from our um, uh, Sophia Gone, as it is called. It is a healthcare center uh, in the west of uh, Weile. And what is obvious uh, here and what we learned also from the MFA is that uh, PVC is maybe not a huge part of, uh, of, uh, of the plastic problem if you look at it in, in, in ton. <laughs> but if you look at it in how it impacts and affects our environment, then it's a huge problem. And this goes not only for Sufiagon, but actually, of course, for the whole area of, of healthcare. So what we are doing here is twofold. One is working with our procurement department so that we can, uh, in the future, decrease uh, the use of PVC that we buy into the, to the city, putting that into our contracts and into our demands. Uh, at the same time, also looking at uh, the whole packaging of um, healthcare products, because as it is now, it is packed uh, both in two, three and four layers of different kinds of plastics, which also is a huge problem. And then uh, number two at Sophie Gorn, working concretely on helping them to sort their waste better. And in that way, of course, increasing the recycling of the, the plastic that are there. Our scenario number two is uh, is uh, in retail. It's a uh, Reimat um, Tusen, which is uh, a supermarket. We have around three hundred and sixty Reimat Tusen in uh, in Denmark. One of them situated in uh, in Weile, uh, west of Weile as well, and we are working with them on identifying more circular loops for um, uh, for uh, plastic packaging. Um, we are working very closely in their, uh, together with them in their value chain and working both very from, you can see a picture here of Reme Thusen from Weile, working with them concretely uh, in this store, but with the test that we are doing there also having um, uh, the um, idea that we want to, of course, scale this to all the other uh, Rema stores in, uh, in Denmark in that way, having a huge uh, impact um, on, uh, on how much plastic they, they generate. So also here, our, um, it is twofold what we do. One thing is value chain work on, on both um, um, uh, packaging, uh, no, primarily on the packaging part, and then also helping the stores uh, sort their waste better because that's a huge challenge. And also uh, data that we have very, it's very hard to get uh, much access to uh, actually. But here we, they actually opened the door and we had the possibility to look concretely into the trash bins and do this, uh, do this analysis. Uh, and then our scenario number two, number three is all about uh, awareness raising and creating better sorting systems for the the habitants of uh, Den Gamle Gård. Uh, also, in this way, working with the same you could say methodology as to test very concretely and micro locally, and then. Um, working together with the housing association to say, okay, if we can make something really work here at Den Gamle Gård, then we will scale it to other housing associations uh, in Weile and in Denmark uh, afterwards. And just to sum it up for, for a few um, minutes, um, on, uh, you could say, Liz, it's kind of a sum up, you could say, of both Liz and my uh, presentation, um, because we have talked a lot about, okay, so what are the opportunities and limitations on, on doing this work together? Um, and there are definitely uh, some really cool takeaways if you as a city choose to work with uh, urban metabolism and also some uh, a little bit some hardship <laughs> in doing so so <clears throat> first of all i would say that this is uh, it gives us both uh, a very holistic and also 
in, in long talks, a comprehensive understanding on what is actually the current state right now and what are the opportunities for impact. Uh, and then also uh, what they developed for us, which is, is really cool for us to work further on, is, uh, is uh, this model of pros and cons. So if we do this and that intervention, what impact will it have uh, and so on. On the maybe limiting side, it's uh, it yes is a technical method. We would never have been able to do it without metabolic, um, and it can also it's very dependent on what kind of data you have as a city and which stakeholders will open the door for you as to share data with you. And just for the last bit here, lesson learned uh, first one and foremost the most valuable <laughs> lesson and what i would say is that we um this this could happen and still happens because we have a really close collaboration so still i uh, i call or write liz and her colleagues to, as to say okay so this part of the mfa how exactly was i to understand that if i have to transform it into really local actions in in this and that point so um so that's a really um that's a an important part you could say of making this work not just being an analysis but actually something that can be uh, practical as well um and then maybe we can just uh have this in the discussion as well uh, what uh, are the outputs the data i have already uh, talked a little bit about um Yes, so I think that's it for me for now. And then Erwin, probably. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Anne Louise. Um, I will ask Simon to start maybe sharing your screen while I introduce you. Um, so the next speaker is Simon Clement from uh, um, ECLA Europe. He's been, um, Simon has been leading the DOS ECLA Europe activities in the field of circular economy for quite some years. Uh, 18 years actually experience uh, working in the sustainable economy and procurement team. He has been coordinating numerous projects and initiatives in the field of sustainable innovation, procurement, circular economy and smart cities. His current and recent coordinated projects include City Loops that he will mention, I believe, in this presentation, the Big Buyers for Climate and Environment Initiative, the Global Lead City Network on Sustainable Procurement. So, uh, Simon, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Erwan, for the for the introduction, and uh, great to be here with you all this morning. Very very glad of this opportunity to speak. Um, so yes, as as Erwan has mentioned, um, I'm working in the field of circular economy, leading ICLE's activities in that field. Um, and for those of you who don't know ICLE, we are a, an international network of local and regional governments working for sustainability. Um, and I'm focused in the in the European office. Uh, but before I kick off my presentation, I should make a, a disclosure, as I am not an urban metabolism expert, it must be said, um, but then, of course, not many people are, and I think that's one of the issues which we are talking about within the session this morning. Um, now, I've been asked here today rather as coordinator of one of the, the sister projects of, of Reflow, which is City Loops. City Loops is a, is, a, is a Horizon 2020 demonstration project which focuses on circular economy solutions in the fields of construction and demolition waste um, and also bio waste and includes a strong focus on the concept of urban metabolism um, within seven small and medium sized different European cities. So hopefully from that perspective, I can bring something to the table as well. Uh, we've been very focused on what's specifically happening in Vela in the reflow project, uh, but I want to take a step back and look at the European context uh, in which this is happening. So those of you who follow European um, developments will no doubt have heard a lot about the green and digital uh, transition, um, which they are aiming to promote. And of course, the concept of circular economy, um, and even more so the concept of urban metabolism, straddles both of these transitions extremely well. Um, the flagship uh, initiative within this is the European Green Deal, um, the flagship program of the new Commission, uh, which has a stated aim to transform the EU into a fair and prosperous society, with a modern resource efficient and competitive economy where there are no net emissions of greenhouse gases in 2050 and where economic growth is decoupled from resource use. Um, so as an overarching strategy uh, for the European Commission, I think we can see that circular economy is central to this. 
Now, following on from the European Green Deal, um, the Commission then announced the Circular Economy Action Plan itself uh, in 2020. Um, and within this, there is a strong focus on the provision of information, the provision of data, availability of information on products, uh, on substances, on supply chains. There's the promotion of a European data space for smart circular applications, for example. There's also a very strong focus on particular material streams, um, such as plastics has been discussed, such as textiles, construction, demolition waste, bio waste. Um, the strategy also, the plan also um, emphasizes the importance of concepts such as um, industrial urban symbiosis, for example. And what's also important with the Circular Economy Action Plan is there is a very clear focus on the role which cities and regional authorities as well play in the transition towards um, the circular economy. Um, alongside the Circular Economy Action Plan, the EU industrial strategy was also announced uh, in 2020. And within this, the circular economy ideas of industrial symbiosis and resource efficiency are central pillars to that strategy as well. Um, now, what you might also well have heard of in uh, the last few months is the desire for the next decade to be the digital decade. So as mentioned, the Commission is talking about a green and a digital transition. Um, the, this was, uh, the focus of this was from last year's Shaping Europe, di Europe's Digital Future, um, Digital Strategy. Um, and this has now been uh, re-emphasized within a set of targets presented within the Digital Compass, which came out this year, and a funding program, the Digital Europe program, which has a number of different funding elements to try to encourage this transition. Now we know that, uh, over the last few years, the collection of data, the transformation of data, the analysis of data, the interconnectivity of people, of places, of devices, et cetera, has exploded. Um, and obviously this presents us with um, both a series of opportunities, but also a series of challenges and dangers and risks within that process as well. Um, and the Commission's approach to the digital decade is of course, to try to maximize what we can gain from this as a society uh, and minimize what those risks to us all are. And this is something that is, of course, central to the topic of circular economy um, and also urban metabolism. Um, what the recent initiatives have also presented are a series of support activities from the European Commission to the topic of circular economy and how that can be implemented within cities. One initiative that is coming up soon um, will be the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative. We're hoping this is going to be launched relatively shortly. Um, and this is the Commission's flagship support initiative for cities and regional authorities wanting to implement circular economy. Um, it will include direct support to a group of pilot city and regional clusters who want to implement circular economy. What it also will include is the development of a methodology for the implementation of circular economy. And certainly if uh, Liz and I have anything to do with this, this will include a strong element of understanding urban metabolism um, and data within that process. Um, but let's see what comes up. Uh, many of you will be aware of the major European uh, R&D funding programs, Horizon 2020, which is just finished, um, and the new upcoming program, which is Horizon Europe. And within both of those programs, there are a variety of um, opportunities, of calls for proposals, which focus on cities and regions, which focus on circular economy, uh, and which focus on particular supply chains, um, and may present an opportunity for cities to, to benefit. The Commission also has um, a circular European circular economy stakeholder platform. This has been running for a number of years um, and is aimed um, both to pr promote exchange, but also to develop ideas between stakeholders at the European level. Um, and this includes a leadership group specifically focusing on the topic of cities and regions. Um, what we have also tried to do to contribute to this process is develop um, what some of you may know, which is the European Circular Cities Declaration. Um, and this is uh, desired, designed to provide local and regional governments with an opportunity to themselves demonstrate their commitment to supporting the transition uh, to a circular economy in Europe um, and contains a list of commitments, which we are asking those who sign up to, um, to commit to, um, which is designed to demonstrate that circular economy should be addressed in a holistic manner, making use of a whole range of different tools um, across the levers available to local and regional governments. Um, now, as you mostly are probably aware, there are already a number of different studies um, which focus on urban metabolism in Europe. Um, I've entered a few links here to where you will find a great deal of information and relevant studies, of course, from metabolic 
Um, circle economy also present a number of metabolic studies that you can find online. Um, metabolism of cities will also have a, a number available um, and you'll find other sources as well. Um, now, there may be an awful lot there, uh, but of course there's an awful lot that aren't there as well. So this remains typically something that is done by a, a small number of ambitious cities. Um, previously, you would have said the bigger cities. I think this is starting now to filter down to smaller cities as well. Um, and I know Metabolic have also been working in Poland, for example. So this is moving to the east as well. We're not just talking about your Amsterdams and Copenhagens anymore, but this is a concept which is spreading, but it's spreading slowly. Um, there are a number of ongoing European projects which focus on this. So Reflow, of course, you're all aware of. City Loops, as mentioned, has an element of this. Uh, there's a project called Duet currently looking at the creation of digital twins, um, which, of course, is very relevant in this field. There have been a number of projects in the past, including Urban Winds, the Urban Waste Project, and going all the way back to um, earlier in the 2000s, the SUME, the SUM project, looking at urban metabolism. So this is not new, but we still need to really make the breakthrough for this to become um, the norm uh, within European cities and regions. Um, one thing you will notice if you, if you review all of those different publications, communications, which I presented earlier, you will not find the expression urban metabolism within them. This is something which is not typically included yet at the policy making level. So why? What are the key challenges that we're facing? And I think these have been already very well presented both by uh, Liz and Anne in their previous presentations. I think there are three main challenges for uh, making urban metab um, an urban metabolic approach more used um, at the city and regional level. The first and foremost of those um, is why? Why would we do this? Uh, what is the benefit of taking the urban metabolic approach? How is this really helping us? And I don't think this is something that is well understood in decision making or practical circles still. The second is how do we do this? Um, how do we actually collect the data that we need to make um, an effective and um, accurate analysis of the situation to allow us to make good policy decisions? And finally, who should do this? Who has the skills, the knowledge and the time um, in order to carry out the work that needs to be done um, in order to make this an effective approach. To dig into those in a little more detail. First of all, as mentioned, the why. Um, the importance of yeah, this urban metabolic analysis is not really understood uh, by, by a, a large number of cities. And we've certainly found this within the City Loops project. It's seen as something that's rather academic um, in, some, in, some, in some ways. And obviously the presentation of detailed graphs, uh, complicated diagrams, et cetera, um, is not helping necessarily in that regards. Some people also see this as simply a, a way of reflecting the obvious. So we'll do these studies, we'll spend a great deal of time to decide that this is a problem area for us, where really this is something that's intuitive and we can all understand that. And this is exactly why examples such as um, Liz and Anne have presented in the case of Vela, where you really have been able to focus and say, okay, surprisingly, this is actually what we need to focus on, is so important um, and making the case, making those stories. So I think what's very clear for me is that having uh, demonstration examples of where there is support to carry out these processes in detail and then documenting precisely these points. Um, so what we have discovered through going through that process is really critical, um, as is an understanding that urban, the urban metabolic approach in terms of circular economy is not limited to an academic MFA study, but rather is a process, a several step process, uh, which is actually as much about collaboration and understanding and discussion um, as it is about the raw numbers as well. So demonstrating and documenting this as much as possible and providing effective communication material for decision makers to allow them to understand why we should do this, uh, I think is really, is really critical. And as a final point, I would very much like to see the expression urban metabolism gain more traction within EU uh, policy circles as well. Um, second point on data. Um, I'm, I know that Anne has had these experiences herself, and I'm sure Liz is encountering these all of the time. And certainly within City Loops, um, we've faced huge challenges and frustrations in the collection of data in order, in order to carry out these exercises. Uh, whether data exists, 
um, whether the cities themselves have access to the data, so who owns the data. And this is not just an issue of private versus public, but which public institution may own the data, at what level is the data, how accurate is the data, do we have to pay for the data, uh, and how comparable are the different data sets that we get. All of these are very important issues uh, which make it uh, difficult to carry out such, a, such, a stand, such an approach as this. Um, so all of these are things that I think we need to address, and to a large extent there are activities already aimed at addressing those, um, but we're certainly not there yet, we've started down that path. Um, and the first of those, of course, is data standardization and interoperability uh, to make sure that the data can speak to each other effectively and allow us to make these type of analyses. Uh, making access to data much, much easier um, is, is critical um, in this approach. Um, and the promotion of broader ideas at the city, regional and national level as well, the creation of digital twins, um, the development of big data platforms, um, uh, at the city level, uh, I think is, is a really important development here to address this specific issue. The final uh, issue, uh, skills. And, and this was also mentioned in the previous presentation. A big question here is who should actually carry out the work behind this? Um, will this uh, urban metabolic approach always require external assistance? Or is this something that uh, cities themselves, city administrations, regional administrations, can do or can be trained or can somehow be guided to do themselves. And I think this is still a question that we don't really have clearly answered. Um, what would help here, um, exactly as Liz was explaining within the Reflow project at the, at the beginning, is the creation of, of simplified tools and guidance to, to help um, public authorities to go through this process. Um, the data collection itself uh, is becoming ever more automated and that itself may help to, to, to ease this process. Um, so that there isn't the detailed work, the detailed difficult work that needs to be done in collecting that in the first place. Uh, training and workshops such as this one, uh, but at a much broader, uh, more, more in-depth level, um, I think would be very helpful. And also City Experience Exchange, try to promote the, the front runners such as Vela discussing that with, with other cities who are thinking about doing this and not too sure, is it really something that we should do or not? Um, speaking to your peers, I think, is one of the most effective ways um, to uh, encourage this to be taken up. Uh, before I finish, just to mention a couple of ongoing activities also in this regards, uh, which are designed to try and address at least the, the second two of these issues. Uh, within City Loops, as mentioned, we're working on urban metabolism as well. Uh, Metabolic of Cities within this is developing, has developed a sector-wide urban circularity assessment methodology and a data hub platform where cities can collect and analyze that data. The idea is here um, that eventually a decision maker online dashboard will be created to allow public authorities to bring in, analyze the data and then use that to make, make informed decisions. Um, they're also developing a number of video tutorials and online training courses. Uh, to assist local governments as well. Um, a second initiative to, to mention is the Circle City Scan. And again, Metabolic have been involved in uh, working on this as well, um, as have ICLE. Uh, this is led by Circle Economy. It's currently in a beta version um, and is going through a testing process at the moment. But here again, the idea is that it creates an online tool which will take users through the four-stage process, similar to that Liz mentioned for, for Reflow. Um, of developing, in the end, a circular economy action plan, but one that is based on uh, informed decision-making through data collection. And you can find more information about that through the link provided. And that is it for me. Here are the contact details and a couple of websites at the bottom. Thanks a lot, Simon, for this uh, very relevant, interesting presentation, giving a, an overview of what is happening currently in Europe? Um, I see we are getting closer to the, um, to the end of this webinar, but there's maybe a couple of questions we could still take on uh, from the last batch of questions that appeared. Um, Massa, Massa was uh, directing a question to you, Simon, related to um, the status of technologies like digital twins for implementation, what are its challenges? I don't know if it's something we can answer <laughs> in a couple of minutes, but uh, I don't know if, if you want to take to take on that that question, maybe uh, Simon. Um, well, I know that it's something that a great many different cities are looking at doing at the moment, um, and there are projects such as the the Duet project that I, that I mentioned, 
Um, many individual cities are looking at this. The cities of, of, of Vienna, for example, I know is looking very closely at how to create their digital twin. Within City Loops, we are um, developing a digital twin for the city of Buda in northern Norway, which is a much smaller city, so also presents quite an interesting model. Um, but I think that there is, there is a, still a substantial challenge there about what we talked about, the data uh, harmonization, interoperability, standardization there and creating these digital twins, plus the model for the digital twin itself. Um, what it should contain, where the data comes from, what platform is being used, the costs involved in that, issues of, of a digital uh, technology lock-in, I think, as well. Um, but it, yeah, I think this is an area where cities themselves can see a great deal of use in creating, and that has to be a, a very encouraging starting point, I would say. Thank you, Simon. Uh, a lot of questions are, are popping popping out related to, uh, you know, how can digitalization support the implementation of such approaches? Um, I, I would I would not necessarily uh, answer to all those questions, but one thing that I want to to mention is that, um, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this this session, is that. We will uh, hold several additional webinars in the coming month, and one in particular will actually address what we are currently prototyping and, and, and experimenting when it comes to the digital solutions that are the core of the Reflow project, uh, mainly the Reflow operating system, Reflow OS, and the Open Data Dashboard. Uh, so we'll actually have time to, uh, to express this further, explain how actually this kind of digital platform can support what we're trying to do at city level. And we'll also obviously have uh, the possibility to illustrate uh, beyond, beyond the definition of such platforms, how it can be useful for cities to tackle such uh, secular challenges. So uh, not everything can be answered today in this very short uh, webinar, but I will really uh, invite you to stay tuned, uh, register to the newsletter of the Reflow project to be informed about uh, upcoming events that, are, that will run throughout the year in the last year of the project. If you do happen to have other questions, uh, challenges related to this kind of issues we started to talk about this morning, uh, we do have a forum on the community section of the Reflow project, so please feel free to register. It takes three seconds and ask questions. You may get uh, actually proper answers from, uh, from the community of, of uh, experts and practitioners that are surrounding the Reflow, uh, the Reflow community. Um, but I will actually like to close that webinar now. So thanks again for the three speakers of today, uh, Liz and Luis and Simon, it was really uh, enriching uh, topics, discussions that uh, gave us a little bit of insight into uh, you know, the role and opportunities of urban metabolism. And uh, I hope you all have a good day and I will uh, say till next time. Thank you.